Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another video of History Value Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Pam Moon. And today, we're going to be discussing her article, Injuries to the Hands of the Man of the Shroud. And so we're getting into um, why she believes the Shroud of Turin is uh, genuine and is uh, actually uh, the Shroud of Jesus himself. And we're also going to be talking about the injuries to the, to the hands of of the man, of the figure in the shroud, how they parallel uh, the biblical account of the crucifixion of Jesus. And she's going to be sharing a presentation to that end to visualize just that. So welcome to the show, Pam. Thank you so much, Jacob. Thanks for the invite. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Of course. Thank you for joining me. So if we could just have a look at, we'll, we'll come on to the injuries to the hands. Right. Um, but I think just an overview, I, I don't know if your viewers are very familiar with the Shroud, but it's always good to do a background of, of what's there. Absolutely. If that's okay. So if, if you could take me to the screen. Um, sure. Does that work? All right, about all there this. Okay, there you go. Is that all right? Can you see that all right? Yes, I can. So let's see. So basically, just, just a quick overview of the Shroud itself. So um i don't know hopefully your viewers are familiar with it but this is one of barry schwartz's images of the shroud um it's 15 feet long it's in turin in northern italy um and you can see that it contains the, the crucified man so this is the front image and this is the back here um okay so these are burns from a fire can you see that uh, there are burns that almost destroyed the shroud in yes, 1532 Mm -hmm. and it's also got some water staining here that you can see down the center um, that doesn't relate to the burns. You can see that the burns are here, but this water staining is slightly different. Okay, so those, that's some of the, and I just have a notice that the fact that there are two corners present and two corners missing on the shroud, which is important for later. Okay, now this is the face of the man on the shroud. Um, it's very, very faint, you can barely see it. Um, it's only 15% different to the background colour of the cloth. Um, and it's all just one shade. So you don't see, you don't see colour, you don't, you don't see the colour of his hair or the colour of his skin. You just see this faint image. But it's much the first photograph of it was that was ever taken was done in 1808 by a guy called Segundo Pia. Um, these images I'm showing you were done by Barry Schwartz in 1978. But so in 1898, it was taken and Skunderpi was so astonished when he saw this image, which is just so much more clear that he almost dropped the plate. Um, he was so much, so astonished by it because, and he realized then that the shroud itself, let's go back a minute, is a negative image and the black and white is the positive, giving you much more information. Okay. And this image of the face, of the man of the shroud looks very like art that tells the story of Jesus. So this is a six, done in 600 AD in Christ Pantocrator. Um, and you can see the, the long nose, the, the beard, the hair one side longer than the other, the big eyes, look at the raised right eyebrow, all those things. There's a, one nostril is larger than the other. They're very, very, very similar these images. So some art historians would say they were, this was painted looking at the shroud but we might come on to that later. So if you look at, so this is the, an image of the crucifixion of Christ, and this is the idea that it's wrapped around the body, front and back. Okay, now you don't, you can't understand that, in my opinion, without actually understanding the New Testament. So if you don't mind, I'll go through the injuries as they're described in the New Testament. Be sure. quite, I'll be quite brief with this, and then see what that looks like on the shelf. okay? So the first thing is one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Can you see there's a huge bruise here? This is this is very um, uh, raised yeah. to the point where the eye is obscured. So um, again, that's quite consistent. Uh, the, the injuries of the man of the shroud are very, very consistent with what we see in the New Testament. Okay. The soldiers led him away to the palace, they put a purple robe on him, twisted a crown of thorns and set it on him. They began to shout out, Hail King of the Jews. So there's some bleeding around the head. Can you see here, down the hair? I sure do. Uh, sorry? Yeah, sorry, I haven't explained this. Blood shows red on the shroud. Um, so there's the color of the image and then there's the color of the blood and the blood is red here. Yeah, I see it, yeah. 
Yeah, okay, now in 1978, some scientists spent time with it and they um, analyzed pollen from around the shroud and, and the pollen that was at the biggest density around the head was from this plant called Gonidilia tuna forti, which has a very sharp thorn. So you can see that this is the back of the head and you can see that it's like a very deep crown of thorns. So it wasn't just a little circlet, as you might imagine, a deep crown of thorns. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. That's what St. John tells us. And if you look at the marks, these are marks of a whip that go down the back of the man. Can you see they look like a little dumbbell with a little ball at each end and a bar in the middle? And they go right from the... Sorry? Are you going to... I was saying, yes, I see it. Yeah, yeah, great. It's much, much clearer in the black and white negative. Can you see these marks? They go from the tops of the shoulders right the way down the backs of the legs. They're quite extensive. Some Italian medics counted them. There are hundreds, hundreds of whiplashes. Um, the soldiers led him away. It's easy to silence. I really he was on his way from the country, put a cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Now, if you look across the shoulder, this is hair here, the, the shoulders here, the marks of the whip are very smudged. Um, suggesting that there was a, a heavy object on them. The knees are bruised, and they found, scientists found dirt on the knees, on the soles of the feet, and on the tip of the nose of the mantra. Um, when they came to the pl place of the skull there, they crucified him along with criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And these are the marks of crucifixion. You can see that there's a, a, there's a blood flow here that comes from the base of the hand and it flows down the arms here and his, a bit closer here. Um, quite a lot of blood flow. Did you want to talk about the hands now as we're looking at them? Sure. Or Yeah, okay. Mm. So... So what's happening here to his hands? Okay, so, right, traditionally artists will draw um, the crucifixion through the palm, don't they? they because it's an easy way in which to visualize crucifixion. Um, but in 1932, a French physician called Pierre Barbet um, experimented with cadavers to work out why it seems the entry point for the wound seems much lower. It doesn't seem to be in the palm here. It seems to be lower. And he tried to work that out. And so he, um, he realized that if you nail somebody lower down, it's like right the base of the hand here, you, it holds the weight of the body, whereas the palm would just pull through. It would just pull through the nail, the bones. It's quite gruesome, isn't it? But just pull through the bones here. But if you nail somebody here, as it would appear to be on the man of the shroud, then it holds. And what's interesting is that um, he argued that when you nail somebody here, the thumb goes in. And you can see that there aren't any thumbs either on. This is actually the left hand and this is the right hand. There are no thumbs on the shroud. So it was seen that that was quite accurate. But... I um I did an exhibition. I've got right life-size replicas of the shroud. And I did an exhibition at, at my husband's church, and um, a senior doctor from the local medical practice, Dr. Andy Husselby, came to the exhibition, and he said actually medium nerve damage doesn't cause the thumbs to go in. Um, so there needs to be another explanation for that. And uh, so I think um, it's possible that the hands were tied together. To hold them in place, um, I think. I think in shroud burials, it, it's often the case that um, the hands are tied um, so that you keep a line of the body, because otherwise you don't want the arm to fall away. So, so that could be one of the reasons. And there is a, a, a bloody cloth called the Holy Blood of Bruges, which is just literally a strip of linen soaked in blood, which may be that that. Um, but also this angle of blood flow is quite interesting down the forearms here and traditionally people have thought that Jesus was crucified at a 45 degree angle that's for how all 
uh, or a lot of crucifixion images are shown, hasn't it? Um, and it's been argued that this blood flow is consistent um, with that angle. But actually, some skeptics of the shroud, um, Galaskelli and Barini, have shown that if you crucify with that, at that angle, the blood would actually just fall off the side of the. I'm not describing this very well, but it would just fall off the side like this to create to create that kind of angle where the blood flows straight down the arm. The arm actually needs to be vertical. Okay, so again, working with Dr. Hustleby, we worked out various ideas of different ways in which the crucifixion could have taken place. And um, one of them could be like a yoke crucifixion. So uh, the crucified would carry the yoke, the cross beam across their backs and their hands would be behind it, which would create a, a vertical angle for the arm. And because it's, it's unlikely that, that there would be that much blood flow down the arm from the nail because a, a penetration injury doesn't tend to cause that much bleeding but when you remove it and I, i'll show you in a minute there's a there's a, a huge hematoma on the back of the hand this is actually an enormous hematoma when, when you remove the nail you would get a flow of blood so that but i'll come on and show you that that image where you can see the hematoma so artists depict depict jesus in different ways that doesn't mean that is how he's crucified um, so I, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not convinced by the arguments that say that this can't be Jesus because it isn't a 45 degree angle of crucifixion, because that's just an artistic idea. Yeah. Um, and, and this is, the, let's go on to the, the feet, actually. Um, this is taken from the Psalms. Dogs around me, a pack of villains encircle me, they pierce my hands and my feet. Okay, let's have a look at where the blood flow, because this is a crucified man without any doubt. This is the entry point for the, for a wound here in the front of the foot, there's no toes here anymore. But this is the back of the feet, which is again, very badly water damaged from the water that was used to put out the fire. But you can make out the feet here, crossed over each other. And what's really interesting, there's a ball, there's some blood flow here to the ball of the foot, but it's also coming sideways from the heel. And that's really significant because we've only ever found two archeological remains of people who've been crucified, i.e. they've still got the nail through the bone. Um, and both of them have the nail going sideways through the heel, which is what you see here. There's the blood flows coming sideways from the heel and from this foot as well, blood flows. Here, um, here's one of them. This is a chap called Johannanen who was found in 1968 in Jerusalem. And you can see that the nail is, it's, it's broke, it's bent over here, so it's got, it's got stuck in the heel bone. And in fact, in 2002, they found another one in Cambridge in England um, with exactly the same wound, the nail going sideways through the heel. Uh, the old, the scriptures, um, the prophetic scriptures say, they will look on me the one he, they have pierced and they will mourn for him as they mourn for the only child and grieve bitterly as one grieves for a firstborn son. So it's like the, the piercing of the heel bone, if you mean here. So going back to John's gospel, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken, the bodies taken down. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. What does that look like on the shroud? Well, it's here. Can you see there's a, a blood flow here? Blood throws red on the shroud. This is the ellipse in which it enters the body, which goes between the fifth and the sixth ribs. Um, and it, it flows out down here. Um, it also flows across the back. Here, this is called the belt of blood. And you can see the redness of the blood here. But what's also interesting is that you can see around all the blood flow, there's a, it's like an exudate of what looks like plasma, or like a watery fluid. You can see it a little bit here. Um, and St. John says, out of his side flow the water of the blood. You can see that on the, on the shroud, the man of the shroud. I poured out my water and all my bones were out of joint. My heart is turned to wax with me and melted within me. 
all my bones are out of joint. If you look at this, this is uh, this is the, the shoulders of the man of the shroud. We've looked earlier at the smudging of the whiplashes across the shoulders. This shoulder is very badly dislocated. This is the normal line of a shoulder. This is badly dislocated. Um, and maybe we, we don't know when that happened, whether it was a result of crucifixion or whether it was carrying a cross and falling. Um, as I said earlier, there's evidence for falling, there's dirt on the nose, dirt on, on the knees. I gave my back, this is quite interesting scripture, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my space, face from shame and spitting. So this is Isaiah 50. I gave my back to the smiters. We've looked at the mark, marks of the whip all the way down the back. My cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. Let's have a look again at the face. So we've looked at the bruise here. This is a whiplash here. There's another across the eye. Um, can you see that the beard is divided here at the bottom? I offer my back to those who bruise my face and pluck my beard. So these, these sort of things, they're, they're just so accurate. Some people say that the Shroud of Turin is like a visual gospel or, a you know, it's like a fifth gospel, that it takes the accounts of the New Testament and visualises them in a way that is quite profound. Because the face is very beautiful, in my opinion, <clears throat> even though it's the face of one who's dead. You know, Pope Francis said that, <laughs> that it's the face of one who is dead and yet in the silence he speaks to us. <coughs> my mouth is bad, bad like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. This is Psalm 22, um, Psalm 21 in the Catholic tradition, um, and it's a prophecy of crucifixion. Later, Jesus, knowing that everything had been finished, he said, I am thirsty. And you can see that the eyes are very sunken. This is a sort of classic sign of dehydration. Now Joseph brought a linen shroud, taking Jesus down, wrapped him in a linen shroud and laid it in a tomb, which he'd laid out of rock and rolled a stone against it. So it's really interesting. Jews bury and Muslims bury in shrouds. That's, that's the way in which they're buried. Um, in fact, one of the greatest scholars on the Shroud is a man called Barry Schwartz. You should get him on your programme. He's brilliant. I actually uh, have already. Have you? Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, sorry, I haven't seen did. that. I'm so sorry. I'll, sorry, I'll Jacob. Send you, I I'll send you the links after after we're done here. Yeah. Please, I would be really, yeah. really grateful. Obviously, I remember Barry saying, you know, <clears throat> that his father had been buried in the Shroud. So it's very, very traditional of Jewish burials. But... Have you ever read an obituary of someone who's died where it says they were buried in a shroud? It doesn't happen. Is that or or, or in in the Western tradition, you know, they're buried in a coffin. You, you never see that in an obituary, and yet every gospel, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all mention the shroud. John goes into a lot more detail. Um, so here we go back to that. Um, I can carry on a bit if you like about things like image formation or, sure. or do, you, do you have any questions about about what I've just said? Oh no, uh, I totally uh, I totally get it. But yeah, go ahead with the images, please. Okay, do you mind? Do you mind? Okay, all right. So I mean, I, I, I'm a Christian. I believe that uh, the most obvious explanation for what happened to Jesus after the tomb is the resurrection. I think it's something that the that the disciples all um, ag agreed with. They all, I think, out of 11 of them, um, John was the only one who didn't die for his faith. They all kept with that view that they'd seen the risen Jesus. Um, so it's either some sort of weird mass hallucination with 500 people seeing a risen Christ or something happened. Um, so this is... This is a tomb called Kibbit Midras in um, in Israel, a first century rolling stone tomb. It gives you an idea of what the stone would have been like. Um, this is called the Golal. This is a dopec which hold, held the, the, the stone open. Um, and what's interesting is that this is about four foot high um, in the life-sized... I mean, actually, the Kibbit Midras has been vandalised now that the whole of the frontage has been taken off, the stone's gone. But actually, um, I spoke to the chap who took this picture, Todd Bolan, and he said this is about four feet high. And there's a significance of that in the next passage I'm going to read to you. Oh, wait a minute, they took the spices, the body of Jesus, bound him in linen cloth with the spices, 
as in the burial cloth of practices of the Jews. This is myrrh and aloes, it's what it looks like. Um, unlikely they use liquid because um, blood is very sacred in Judaism, you wouldn't wash it off the body. More, most likely to be resin. Um, these are incense resins. It's a bit long, but I will read this because this is John's testimony of the resurrection. First day, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while it was still dark. She saw the stone had been rolled away. So she ran and went to Simon Peter, the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went towards the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple, John, outran Peter, probably a bit younger, and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, because it's only four foot high, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. And Simon Peter came following him and he went to the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying and the napkin which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, St. John, who reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and he believed. For as yet they didn't know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So the tomb isn't empty. Some Christians often talk about the empty tomb. It wasn't empty, it was full of linen. Um, and what was that linen? Well, um, this is called the Sudarium of Oviedo. It is uh, uncontroversially the napkin that had been around Jesus' head. Um, it's got a historical record going back to first century Jerusalem. Um, it's a cloth folded in blood. It's just soaked in blood. But if you match, this matches the back of the, of the, the Shroud of Turin. This matches the mouth. Basically, uh, the great scholars of the Sudarium of Oviedo, like... Um, uh, Jorge Rodriguez and um, Mark Guskin would argue that um, Jesus on the cross, they covered his face. We cover the face of the dead to give them dignity. And also because blood is so sacred in Judaism, they would have wanted to catch the blood coming from the mouth and the nose from the spear wound. Um, so this is wrapped around the back of the head. This is um, the mouth. And then they folded it over. And as they brought him down from the cross, more blood came from his mouth and his nose. The same blood group as the Shroud of Turin, and as I say, these, these uh, blood stains match. So what causes the image to appear on the Shroud of Turin? Well, you've spoken of Irish wars, but this is an image taken in 1976 by John Jackson, who I was actually, and, and Eric John Powell, I was actually really privileged to meet John Jackson at a conference once. And he was so staggered when he saw this, that normally in a VPH image analyzer, a, a, a two-dimensional cloth would distort, a picture would distort, you'll get uh, something that's dark will recede. But when he took it, what he found was the perfect three-dimensional image of a man. So it, the, it, the, the image was, the shroud was created while it was draped over a three-dimensional figure. And, you know, I mentioned earlier to you about the hematoma on the back of the hand. Just have a look at the back of the hand here and how raised it is there. Okay, so John got together a group of scientists from all over the world. Barry will have talked to you about this. Um, they were called the Shadow Chin Research Project, STIRP. And here is Barry. Um, uh, he, this is he taking the photographs that I bought copies of and have put an exhibition together. You can see here the shroud, this is the face here, the arms crossed going down, and this is the back of the body here. And he's taking it from about 10 feet away because actually, as you get nearer to the shroud, it's more difficult to see the image because it it just sort of tends to blend into the background cloth a bit more. You can see it, but and so he's taking it from about 10 feet away. This is all the equipment that he bought. I'm sure he must have mentioned to you that they could fit it in a laptop these days, but actually at that stage, it was state of the art equipment that they've got. This, these are three important men. This is John Jackson I was talking about. This is Ray Rogers, and this is um, Professor Rigi, who, and they're separating the cloth. I don't know if Barry's mentioned this to you already. Separating the cloth from the background cloth so they can shine a light under what's called the number three blood stain, who you can see. And they realize that the, the blood seeped into the cloth, the image disappeared. So it's not, there's no density of paint, it's not a paint. They looked at the image in detail. So these are the fibers which contain. Uh, which is the background color of the cloth linen this is these are the fibers that contain the image and it's a it's the, the, a tenth of a diameter of a hair on your head so 0 0.0005 of a millimeter this slight change which causes the image to be created on the shroud they looked at the blood and discovered that yes it is blood it's got hemoglobin and uh, 
um, Billy Rubin and various other things. Um, it's AB blood group, the same as Sudarium of Oviedo. But one of the interesting things about the shroud is that it remains, the shroud blood is that it remains red. It normally, blood would normally oxidize and go brown or black, but this remains red. That's one of the mysteries of it. And Barry says, we can tell you what it's not, not a painting, not a photograph, not a scorch, not a rubbing, but we know of no mechanism to this day that can make an image with the same chemical and physical properties as the image on the shroud. So it remains, you know, a, a, an extraordinary mystery. Is it a natural phenomenon created by sweat, spices, ammonia? Well, it's unique. There's nothing else like it on it. But also it's not, it's not a contact image. So if I painted my face with paint and I put a cloth across it, when I took it off, it wouldn't look like the shroud because it would be, because my face isn't flat, it would be wider. So my ears would be out here somewhere. So it's not created by some contact with a particular substance. It's a different mechanism for creation. So this, this is one poem by Rudyard Kipling, which says, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I know, all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and when. Okay, so if this is the burial shroud of Jesus, then we know what it is, it's a shroud. We know why it was wrapped around his body. We know when, probably, I think they think April the 3rd, 33 AD. Um, how, we don't know. We, there's a mystery. We, we don't know how the image is created. Where, Jerusalem, who, Jesus. If it isn't, if it isn't that, if that isn't the answer, what is it? And that's where I think we're in all sorts of problems with the radio carbon date because there is no answer. There is no, there is no artist who was capable of creating something like this in the Middle Ages. Um, you know, if you looked, there was no artist who drew without paint for the start. Um, there's no name, there's no school, there's no, you, you can't say they were experimenting with negative images in Siena in, 30, in the 14th century because they weren't so it is and, and but, but, but those things they call the 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 five w's what why when where and who the basis of all knowledge you know and, and you have to have an answer to those questions um so that and so that's one of the reasons i, I believe that the shroud is actually wrapped jesus Carbon dating, let's have a look at that, because that's why a lot of people think it's not genuine. So the carbon dating was taken from here, this corner down here, and this is the bit here. I think actually that, that's not a good graphic, it's actually taken from around here. And this is Professor Regi, who I think I showed you a picture of earlier, cutting the shroud. What's interesting is that the shroud is orange, not light, like it should be here. This is the actual colour of the cloth. What he's cutting is orange very similar to the colour of the burns here. And in fact, if you look at this, is after it's cut, this is the background cloth in which it's lying. Can you see the background cloth is two different colours? This is the natural cloth, natural colour of unbleached cotton. This is dyed. The shroud is the same colour as this. So this corner that they carbon dated is dyed without any question. And dyeing just add dyeing and all sorts of other contaminants add more carbon into the into the, um, is that, so when you burn it and count the molecules of, car, of, of, of C14, you're left with modern C14 in amongst um, the rest of the cloth. Now I took a remuneration request on Oxford University for them to show their photographs, because they took a number of photographs of the shroud, and this is the most detailed of a close-up. And you can see that not just is it orange, but it's covered in minute particles of gum. Um, now, one of the Shroud scientists that Barry was great friends with, called Ray Rogers, was given samples of the, 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 the fibre, near the fibres where they tested it for carbon dating. And what he found was a dye called madarut dye and gum trigacanth, um, which is a gluey, sticky gum that sticks the, guy, the dye to the linen, because linen doesn't absorb um, dye very well. There's black, black threads, there's massive amounts of repair. So I think the carbon date isn't 
accurate anymore. We can't take it seriously. But can I just move on to something a little bit different, which is like what we can learn from the man of the shroud, whatever you might believe him to be. This is what Jesus said. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist anyone who's evil. And if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Let's have another look at the right cheek of the man of the shroud. Can you see the huge bruise here? The whiplash there. And I think this is someone who practiced what they preached. You know, because if this is Jesus, then he taught, do not resist someone who is evil. Do not use violence against others. Um, and here he is. The first wound was a bruise to the cheek fairly soon after a whiplash to the face, and yet he allowed them to crucify him. And I think it's a really, really interesting thing. Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi, they both took Jesus' teaching on nonviolence very, very seriously. You know, Gandhi said, there are so many things that I would be prepared to die for, but nothing that I would be prepared to kill for. Do you know what I mean? That sort of, that sense of, it's not about not, not resisting evil, it's about choosing not to be violent. You know, and I think there's so much to learn about things like forgiveness. The New Testament would say, the Gospels would say that Jesus' is worth the Father forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, that, that even at his moment of death, just prior to his death, what he was asking was for forgiveness. And, and those are enormous challenges to all of us when we're hurt, when someone, you know, causes us extreme anxiety and hurt. And, you know, how, how do you forgive? How do you, how do you forgive? How do you try and not live in a way of hate? Or, you know, how, how do, it, it, they're really, really difficult lessons I think for all of us to look at but I think this is someone who practiced what he preached and the gospel of love that he preached uh, you know Christians have not been great followers of Jesus over the centuries they have behaved very badly um you know they, they haven't followed his example but his example is very challenging there's a I think I don't know if yeah here you go this is another thing that I find really interesting, is that this is a colorblind image. We don't know the color of his skin. We don't know the color of his hair, his eyes. We just don't know. And, and I, th I think, I know in America, Black Lives Matter movement was very strong, wasn't it, after the death of George Floyd. And I think, I think there's something about the nature of this which is really powerful. This is not a white face or a black face, or it, it has no color. It is a universal, universal human kind. And I think, so, so for me, if this is Jesus, then it's about saying God is not racist. No. Um, and I think that's a, a really important lesson for us to look at as well. Um, you think, oh yeah, we may feel about the, the commentary called Grim Justice, which you can watch on YouTube. David Rolfe is the great filmmaker of the Shroud. He's made some incredible films. You should interview him. He's really, really good. Um, and so knowledgeable. He's met so many world experts on the Shroud. So, um, and then Bruno Barber, who used to be the head of Shroud Science, and Turin said, we will continue the to study the Shroud until we understand the mechanism that creates the image. And the carbon date needs to be redone because the wrong sample was taken. I mean, I, I, Bruno is is such a fantastic man, um, I, I, and I struggle to sort of dis disagree with him. But I, I, I think until we fully understand all the different contaminants that are on the shroud, from fire, from water damage, from all sorts of things, from dye, from gum, from you know, we don't want to make the same mistake again. 
but also until we understand the mechanism which creates the shroud. An Italian, phys you know, many physicists would say it was some form of radiation or light. The, the he current head of science is a, a man called Paolo de Lassero, um, who has experimented with lasers to try and create that surface phenomenon. You know, so massive amounts of power for very short period, you know, 40 billionth of a second. Lots of light, but for very short period of time. We, we don't know how the image is created. We can't recreate it. Um, so until we understand all those things, you know, maybe we, we need to think seriously about another carbon date. But certainly I think the last one isn't isn't valid. And, and in fact, Oxford University did publish a paper written um, by uh, Tristan Casabianca and Emanuela Marinelli, one of the great, um, great shr Italian shroud scholars, and uh, some, some statisticians that they were working with who, um, who looked at the fact that the, the, the carbon date um, sample data is not homogeneous. Um, which would suggest that there's huge problems with the sample that was tested. It's a great science, carbon dating, but you've got to get the right sample um, to really get an accurate result. Uh, do you want a history or are you not? Oh, I've had enough now. <laughs> sure. Yeah, are you sure? Okay, yeah. history. Is, is there a genuine history that could take the shroud back? This is very brief, okay? Back to the tomb of Jesus. Well, it was shown for the first time in the West in 1355. This is a pilgrim medallion. You can see that this is clearly the shroud on the medallion. This is uh, later than that. I believe this is Kramash, Lucas Kramash the Elder. And you can see there's some marks here of a, of a, um, a, a sort of like poker holes um, or the, uh, incense burns that happened to the shroud. This is before the fire. This was taken in 1516, 1550, 16, yes. So before the fire. Um, and what's interesting is that Lucas Cronash was a grand master, as, as gifted as Michelangelo or Leonardo. And this is, I believe this is his work and this is what he's created. It almost looks cartoonish. And so the idea that if, if a grand master of the Renaissance can't make something that looks as good as the Shroud, how on earth would someone in Giotto's area have done it. Anyway, that's just a, just a hypothetical. So this is um, this is an image which I believe shows the shroud in 1036 being carried through the streets of Constantinople. When it was damaged, it, the, it, it, when it was once folded into four when it was damaged by incense, as I showed you in that image before. Here it was you fold it down the down the middle and then down there, and then these these all match. And when you fold the shroud, you get an image like this. And the text in this ancient manuscript says that the holy shroud was carried through the streets. Um, and this army, uh, but, but it, the, the image has been misclassified as the death of a king in 820 AD. But um, this army arrived in Constantinople in 988 AD. It's the army of Vladimir the Great, um, the Kievan Rus, who came out of Kiev, um, in Ukraine and Russia, Novgorod in Russia. And going back to what I said about earlier about violence, um, this army, I believe, protecting the Holy Shroud in 1036, um, is made up of Ukrainians and Russians. And yet the war that is so awful at the moment, that has caused so much suffering to so many people, is between Ukrainians and Russians. Um, and I feel I, I, it breaks my heart to see this image where they were um, one army. Anyway, there we go. Um, this is the, sorry, this is very out of focus. This is the arrival of the cloth called the Holy Mandalion in 944 in Constantinople. And um, this is uh, uh, Romanos, the, the, I think it's Romanos the first or his representative greeting it. That cloth was, the Holy Mandalion was discovered in 525 in the, hidden in the walls of the city of Edessa. Um, and at that in five two after the five to five you find the image of Jesus becoming very much like the shroud. This is the, the six hundred made in six hundred Christ Pantocrator. This is Abgar 
the fifth, who was a king in the first century, who wrote to Jesus saying, um, come and heal me, I'm sick. And Jesus wrote back by a scribe saying, I must do my father's will, but I will send to you. There's a legend in the city that a disciple came bearing a cloth, not made by hands, which uh, the, the historian, the great shroud historian Ian Wilson has argued was the shroud. Um, folded into eight, there's, there's crease lines on the shroud that suggest it was once folded in that way. So that all you could see was the face and that's how it was displayed. Now the letter of Jesus to Abgar still existed. It, it was taken to Constantinople in 1031. There's an image of that of it arriving. So this is very embedded in history, this, these, this Abgar, a holy Mandelian image of Edessa, then image. There you go. And I think, oh, this is Paolo de Lestra. And then this final quote from Isaiah. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us the peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. So that's a Christian interpretation of a prophetic word that we would argue is fulfilled in Jesus, that it is to bring peace, to bring love, to bring restoration, that he was pierced, that his feet were pierced, that his hands were pierced. There we go. I think that's me. So stop sharing. Great. Oh, well, I, only, oh yeah. well, I only have a couple of questions. That was an excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. So basically, the crux of it is, is that the wounds of Jesus throughout the shroud matches mm -hmm. the biblical description of the crucifixion. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And not, not just matches it, it um, and I've, I've studied it for years and years and years and years, and, and you know, you find, so, so for instance, there's a psalm that talks about the, the mortal agony of my bones. You know, so it's, it's not just that it matches what the new, tough, the gospel writers say, it's that it matches lots and lots of other scriptures as well um, and illuminates them. The plucked beard, you know, that's not traditionally seen as one of the wounds of, of Jesus, you know. Um, but it's there in the prophetic writings of of the psalms. And do you think that the reference to the Mendelian that was uh, uh, found at it, that, that was delivered at Edessa, do you think that is the same as a shot of Turin? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. I do because, um, right, so it is an image not made by hand. I mean, there are, there are other hypotheses hmm. of how the shroud got to Constantinople, but the, the book that I have spent years studying, which is called um, the, 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 it's the Historical Chronicle of John Scalitzis, Ionis Scalitzis, and it's the only surviving illuminated manuscript from the period um, which where the Varangian Guard image, the, the Kievan Rus image comes from, where the image of Romanos I kissing the Holy Mandelian comes from that that manuscript. So it's the only surviving manuscript um, of that. So, so that makes it really, really important. It's, it, it's got, it shows how Greek fire looked like, for instance. It's our only record of what Greek fire looked like. So, and, and the image of Odessa is the most central image. But also, um, a friend of mine, Joe Bywater, um, discovered that um, the, the emperors of, of the Byzantine emperors from the sixth century onwards used to wear something called the loris round their, round their necks. You can see, if you look at any ancient images of the, the Byzantine emperors, the, the old ivories, the images in, in the Madrid Skylitzes, um, they will they'll have a crown and they'll have a loris. And the loris represented the winding cloth or the burial cloth of Jesus. And they, they wore it from the sixth century, the time of the discovery of the Holy Monday. Okay, so, so this badge of office, the crown and the lords, why, why would they wear the burial of Jesus around their necks if they didn't have it? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, and, and so yeah, I, I would say that, that that history is quite strong. And of course it was it was sacked. It was sacked out of Constantinople. There's historical records that um, 
Um, so yeah, the picture I showed you of the 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 Kievan Rus, they were taking it, they were taking the shroud, I believe, from the palace to a place called St. Mary Blanchenai, which was a church on the outskirts of Constantinople. And in that church, the shroud, the shroud of Jesus was shown from above the head to below the hands. And it was raised up every Friday night so that crusaders could see it. And, and you get a lot of images coming out of that period where the, sort of the water stain, which is in the center of the chest, is visible on that art. Um, you know, why, why put a, a, a diamond shaped pattern in the center of the chest, unless you've actually seen it. Mm. And, yeah. and also the, 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 the little holes, those burn holes, I showed you the incense holes. There's a manuscript dating to the 12th century, 1190s, um, called the Prey Manuscript, which shows the Shroud of Jesus with those holes in it. So that damage must have happened before 1190s, which is why I'm trying to say it happened in 1036 when they carried the Shroud through the streets. And those, th those are just some of the arguments. In there. Well, thank you for joining me today, Pam Moon. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And the shrine is just an extraordinary thing. It, it, um, extraordinary thing. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.